When I say the name Holy Spirit, how does that make you feel? For a lot of Christians, they either get super excited or extremely nervous. And that's because there's a lot of difficulty wrapped around this name. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Eric, you've had a colorful past with this idea of the Holy Spirit, or even worse, the Holy Ghost. Uh, could you <laughs> even just tell us part of your story? Yeah, this, uh, for me, I think I had a whole season, and I, I would probably say three years where I couldn't even mention the name Holy Spirit. Like, as I was a public speaker, even at the time, and I'd be in front of crowds, and I would just strategically avoid the the, the phrase, you know, it's the, the name, technically, is what it is. And... Uh, and it's because I saw abuse. When Leslie and I were first married, we wrote our first book. We were invited to uh, travel the world. And so we, we went down uh, under uh, into Australia. We had a tour along the, the coastline. And there was this movement uh, that had found its way to Australia right in front of our tour. It's almost like you would say the same person that set up our tour set up their tour, which is a scary thought. And Every church we went to had had this movement, and it was you know where everyone was on the floor laughing, and it was all these bizarre things were happening. Okay, we had people barking like dogs, slithering like snakes, and roaring like lions, and then a lot of laughter. I like laughter. I'm not against dogs. I'm not against lions. I don't really I like snakes. snakes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I had to encounter this as a young leader. And it was one of the most difficult and challenging things I ever faced in my life. I remember giving a message on true revival, and that was sort of like my response to this. It's like, you want to know what true revival is? And But in the process, the Holy Spirit, and the, and the name of the Holy Spirit was always the moniker that this was under. It was the banner, like the Holy Spirit is doing this, the Holy Spirit is doing this. And I found myself, even though I didn't look at the Holy Spirit as evil, I looked at the term the Holy Spirit as somehow being a badge that anyone that was off their rocker used. And so when I came back, and now I'm in leadership, in ministry, traveling this country, I was really struggling with this topic. Meanwhile, I'm praying personally that God would help me past this hurdle of knowing intellectually how I'm supposed to live and actually having the power to live it. So you can sort of see the the tensions going on inside of me. Give me a little background for you. Was this? Did you have the similar tensions, or was this always a totally fine uh, topic for you? Yeah, I've never been to Australia, so uh, <laughs> I have a totally different experience. As if that's the only place on earth. <laughs> There's a lot of crazy around here too. Uh, it is interesting. I, you know, I grew up in the church, and we would use the term, but I actually don't think it was ever explained. In other words, it was this foreign mystical concept where you, you know, we would pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, and, and you, you would throw out the language. But in terms of training, I had no clue. Hmm. Uh, and it wasn't until years later that I actually had a, a mentor and a Bible teacher who said, do you, do you recognize it's not scary? Yeah. You actually need the empowerment of the Spirit to function as a Christian, which I'd love for us to get into. But it's, it's actually just, it's the Spirit of Christ. So if Jesus is scary, then you better be, you better be scared to death of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> But if Jesus is not scary, which he's not, then you can actually trust yeah. and rely on the Holy Spirit. And that actually did a flip in my brain. Yeah. I was like, oh, and it actually became this thing that actually, he became someone I longed for and, and yeah. needed in my life rather than just this abstract mystical concept. But I think the reason we're putting it in this list, in this series where we're dealing with terms that have been taken hostage by the enemy, this is not the enemy's territory. The enemy has nothing to say to me about the Holy Spirit, and yet he has said a lot to me. And he said a lot to many people around uh, this world in regards to their a, a, a agreement, their relationship with truth. I, I was telling, I think it was last week I, I was mentioning that one of my buddies, you know, grew up in a church where they couldn't say the name the Holy Spirit, so it was the Father, the Son, and the Holy Bible. And I actually get it. I, I really do, especially after what I went through where I didn't quite know how to appropriate. It's like, okay, I know that that's truth, but I don't want to speak it lest I mislead someone. And I've had this happen with multiple other topics. In the upcoming weeks, we're going to talk about faith and grace, 
Well, I grew up also with something known as the faith movement, which was, you know, another disturbed notion that is going to go away from the biblical model into a weird self flesh model. And then I also saw the same thing happen with grace. So to the point where I struggled with even knowing how to use the word, lest I encourage that behavior. And so whenever we have had sort of this radioactive zone in our life, it's like dead earth, where something bad has happened in one of those zones of truth, we have to deliberately labor to recover that territory. And the only way we can recover it is with the truth of the word of God. We need the truth to overwrite the lie. The Holy Spirit is not the cause of wacko behavior. He's not the cause of fleshly behavior. He's not the cause of someone barking like a dog. Okay, boy, did I just make a statement there. But he's not. He sponsors Christ behavior. That's what he does. He is the revealer of Jesus Christ. The only reason you and I know Jesus Christ is because the Holy Spirit has worked on us to convince our soul of his virtue, to showcase his loveliness. That's what the Holy Spirit does. And according to scripture, that is his job description. His job description is not to make us behave just weird, odd, and strange. It's to actually elevate our behavior so that when people see us, we behave like Jesus. Now that behavior may look odd to the world, but it's Jesus behavior. It's not barking like a dog. Yeah, it's really good. And I, maybe if we can just even summarize that, that lifestyle, it actually is just, and this is probably a bad term that we probably need to redeem as well, but it's the idea of holiness, uh -huh. which is not legalism. It's not self-effort. He is called the Holy Spirit for a reason. Uh -huh. I mean, he is called the comforter. He is called the truth. He's called the helper. But it is amazing that the primary title is Holy Spirit. And the fact that he's wanting to produce holiness in us, could you, could you just walk us through? I, I love how you define holy or holiness, mm -hmm. but what does that actually mean? When we, when we say that the spirit of God is the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. and that he is wanting to produce holiness in us, what does that practically mean? Mm -hmm. I think it's important, even before I answer that, for us to recognize that there is a spiritual realm. I know, profound statement there, but there's a spiritual realm and it's full of spirit activity. And there are spiritual personalities in it. So, you know, in most, we could probably add demons to our list of, of topics that some people just do not like to address, but it is a biblical concept. And there are dark spirits, or we could say it this way, unholy spirits. Holiness is, means set apart, other than. So we have when we followed Adam's trajectory, went off the reservation of what God intended for our lives. And what he intended was for us to be revealers of who he is, to be little miniature pictures of his nature in this earthly realm. But we went off, and that's, of course, sin. And so what Jesus Christ is interested in doing is bringing us back to that place where this body that we are carrying around can actually be a revelatory device to showcase the unseen realm. So there's all these false versions of this, which is why I'm sensitive on this point and why so much of the church gets caught up in this is there are false spirits, there are false prophets, there is a false rendition of the Holy Spirit, which could make us fearful and sort of give us the EBGBs too at one level because there's all sorts of horror movies made about things like this but it doesn't need to even give us that it's just off it is there's an enemy out there that is trying to distort and to disturb the reality of the truth of the kingdom of heaven long and short the holy spirit is not our problem it is the antagonistic spirits that are undermining and attempting to counterfeit the work of the true and the real which is why we as the church must not throw out the true and think we're going to be more true in doing it because one of his other names is the spirit of truth but he is other than us so when he moves in i would say one of the reasons why he's called the holy spirit more than any other is because he's moving into an environment that is opposite of him and he's going to change it he is going to alter it to now reveal the otherly realm and that is a beautiful thought to think that it's not a work that Nathan or Eric does. It is a work that the Holy Spirit must do to make me like Christ. And that's what holiness is. It's a work of the Holy Spirit in Eric and Nathan to change us, to alter us so that the words we speak are no longer 
earthly words, so that the actions we have are no longer earthly actions, so that the things we're looking at with our eyes, the things we're listening to, the ponderings in our head are actually going to be different. They're being conformed to the image of someone other, someone that is otherly, someone known as Jesus Christ. I I really, really love this idea. And I think the reason is, is, you know, when when I read scripture, I'm always confronted with the reality that I am not as I should be, that I am... I, I'm not thinking the way I'm supposed to be thinking. I, I don't have the right attitude. My motives, I mean, I, I can fake it, but my inward motive is 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 tainted. And <clears throat> I could only fake it for so long before the revelation of truth comes out of my life. And what I love about this idea of the Holy Spirit is that when, when, I, when I truly embrace Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit moves inside, right? I have my personal Pentecost mm-hmm. and, and I'm now filled with the very Spirit of Christ. I, and you've already fleshed this out, but I just love this idea that he is transforming, he's conforming, he's renewing, he's radically altering everything in my life so that I can come back to be that image bearer that I was supposed to be, that God made us, you know, in Genesis chapter one. And, and I love this idea that if, if the Holy Spirit truly is the spirit of Christ, then what he's going to be championing in my life is Jesus. Yeah. And and again, I, I know we, we use a lot of scary terms with the Holy Spirit and it, <laughs> and it makes it worse if we say Holy Ghost. <laughs> <laughs> but yet it is so refreshing and it is so exciting and it is so uh, stirring in my soul when I realize that the only way I can actually live out the Christian life, uh, the only way I can actually have the thought, the attitude, the mindset, the language that I'm called to have is that the Holy Spirit is actually going to be interacting with my life and he's going to be somehow empowering and doing in my life the very thing that I cannot do. That's right. Uh, Ian Thomas used to say, uh, you can't. Mm -hmm. You can't live the Christian life, Mm -hmm. but he can. Mm -hmm. And the reason he can do that is because he's now come to indwell your life through his spirit. Mm -hmm. And he's going to bring about this reality. Mm -hmm. Uh, One of the things that we've often talked about is the more you're filled with the Holy Spirit, it's interesting, the more you actually don't talk about the Holy Spirit, which is a strange thing. Uh, I know a lot of people in my life who, when you listen to them talk, they're obsessive about the Holy Spirit. And I smile and and I have no problem with that, except to say, it is amazing that the people I, who I would say, man, they are so spirit filled, their life exhibits the spirit of the Lord, strangely don't talk about the spirit very often. They actually talk about Jesus. And I think that's actually a biblical yeah. uh, concept. In fact, I'll, let me just read this. I love John 16. Jesus is talking about talking to the disciples that it's actually better that he go away. And I've always thought if I was one of the disciples, I've been like, excuse me, <laughs> no, it's actually better that you're here. Yeah. He says, no, 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 you don't understand. And in verse 13 of John 16, Jesus says, but when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth for he will not speak from himself, but he, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will disclose to you what is to come. And which is a phenomenal thought that according to Jesus, what we have right now with the influence of the Holy spirit is actually better than what the disciples had when they were patting him on the back, Mm -hmm. walking down the road, you know, on, on the way to Jerusalem, because if Jesus is physical right here on planet earth, and we know he's physical seated at the right hand of the father, but if he was physical and that's all we had, uh-huh. well, then I would have to go down and visit and knock on the door and have a schedule. But the fact that he has gone away and he sent forth the spirit, I actually get to have him everywhere I go. 24 seven. Which is, uh, that is so amazing. <laughs> uh, and to think that in eternity, we actually get both. We get the infilling yeah. plus the physical Jesus. <laughs> but then listen to what Jesus says. He says in John 16, the Holy Spirit, that spirit of truth, is going to glorify me, for he will take of mine and disclose it to you. In other words, it's this, this phenomenal idea that the Holy Spirit is constantly guiding us into Jesus. He's grabbing us by the hand. The, the Greek idea is not just giving you directions. He, he's, he's going to grab you by the hand and lead you, guide you. Hey, watch out for that pothole. Oh, come mm-hmm. over here. Hey, jump mm-hmm. over this fence. He's going to guide you into Jesus. And his whole purpose is, is yes, he's a comforter. Yes, he's a helper. Yes, he's... You know, he's the enabler of, of God's life in us, but he's going to be constantly lifting up and glorifying Jesus. And strangely, it's like he gets out of the way so that Jesus can be more clearly seen, mm-hmm. which I think is a beautiful picture of us, yeah. that the more, the more I get to know Jesus, the more I'm filled with his spirit, the more I should be hidden and the more Jesus should be seen. I love that idea. There was a, you gave a message last night, actually, and uh, you were talking about, uh, just some of the the function that we have as as believers that there are certain standards that 
come to bear upon us as believers. And we all feel them, you know, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, and don't do this. And it's so that we can reveal the heavenly realms because a Christian wouldn't do that. Uh, whether that's sensual behavior, whether that's lying, whether that's stealing, a Christian wouldn't participate in any of these things. But when we hear that, and so even when you're teaching, you'll, you'll explain how this is accomplished. It's accomplished by the power of grace at work within you. The Holy Spirit is the, is the means. But it's weird how we have such a default as humanity mm. to hear a standard, to hear a law, to hear a behavior that is required of us, and we immediately turn inward. And we're like, okay, how can I resource that behavior? How can I just decide? I'm sick and tired of this behavior in me. I am going to change. So we look to ourselves to make something impossible happen. It sounds very noble on the outside, but it is a form of self-righteousness, which you know, according to scripture is filthy rags in God's eyes. It is not satisfying to God because he has actually given us the resource. He has given us all that we need and his name is the Holy Spirit. And that when we yield to the Holy Spirit and when we allow the Holy Spirit to live and to dwell and to have his being within us and to do the working through us, which is a coordination thing, especially if we're not used to doing it. It's like, what does that look like? And when you're first hearing it, that you're like, oh, that sounds weird. Well, welcome to Christianity. It is not as you once lived. It is a new way of living. You are no longer leaning on your own ability, your own intellect, your own reality. You're now leaning on God's. Yep. You are saying, God, I trust that you know best. I trust that you can accomplish something. And that's the secret of learning to abide in his ability to allow him to work in and through us. Both of us, you know, I, I think we come from two maybe ends of that spectrum. One is the non-use of the Holy Spirit. So you didn't really have a negative view, just sort of a, a nondescript view, right? Which is equally non-powerful. Then I had the disturbed view. In other words, where I didn't even want to bring it up, don't want to talk about it, lest I be associated with this character or this group of people over here, which I look at as a little wacko, right? Both of us have a very strong view of the Holy Spirit now. We love, dearly love the Holy Spirit. And it's not, if anyone hangs around with Daily Thunder, they know we don't just talk about the Holy Spirit all the time. We talk about Jesus. Jesus is the forefront point. We believe that the Holy Spirit living in us has a singular objective, which is what you were just saying, and that is to reveal Jesus. And so we want to agree with the Holy Spirit. We want to walk in stride with the Holy Spirit, and we want to make Jesus known the same way the Holy Spirit desires to make Jesus known. I had to go through a process of cleansing in this area where I had to agree with truth and let the barnacles go away. It's like, that just is false. I don't agree with that. And I believe, Lord Jesus, that what you gave me with the Holy Spirit was a good gift. It was a good and perfect gift, and I receive it. I accept it, and I embrace it. And even if I look weird in talking about the Holy Spirit, and someone might think, oh, he's like this, I'm okay with that now because it's still the truth. It's, this, is, this is God we're talking about. We're not talking about some you know, distant relative, uh, you know, some distant cousin of God, you know, it's like you know, three times removed. We're talking about God himself, yes. part of the Trinity, that is the personal extension of the work of the Father and the Son in my life. And I, and I think just for everyone who's listening, <clears throat> if you find your Christianity lacking, in, in, in other words, if you find yourself just always locked in fear or you're always struggling with lust or you're, you're getting distracted by the nonsense of our culture and, and you're looking at scripture saying, man, I, I esteem this life, but how on earth can I live this? The solution actually is the very thing we're talking about. You cannot do this outside of him, which means you desperately need the Holy Spirit in your life to bring about the life of Christ. The only way that we can actually live the life of Christ in the generation in which we live or any other time in his human history <laughs> is the fact that we need God to be God in and through our lives. Amen. And he does that through the Holy Spirit, which I think is so profound. And I think this, just this topic of the Holy Spirit, if people could grab a hold of it afresh and hit reset in just their mind of like how lovely and how beautiful yeah. and how necessary 
he is in our life, I think it would radically change how we are living today as believers. We have uh, an old sermon that we gave. I don't. I think that's it would probably be the way they would access it, right? It's called the old servant. Yes. I said an old sermon, and then I, I call it the old <laughs> servant. Uh, that's a, but it's called the old servant, and it goes back to the Old Testament to sort of prepare the way for us to understand the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. It's it's that would probably be a good starter package. Right. And people. I can put a link for that in this the show notes for this message Great. too.